Hello everybody, I'm in the Littlewood, also known as Martin, welcome back to the channel and welcome to my guide on how to play Cube World in 2019. So the reason for this video is because there's been some pretty significant changes to the game compared to the alpha version, so no matter if you're a new player or you're an existing player, we've all been getting the same thing when we first spawned in, absolutely destroyed and one-tapped by everything. And yes, this is a little bit of design fault on Wally's side, but once you know what's going on, I actually don't think it's as bad as people are making out and I think people have been really unfair in the way that they're reviewing the game. So let's just get straight into it then and just as a very quick side note as well this is actually based on the beta build of the game so this is Tuesday as I'm recording this and the full 1.0 version comes to Steam on Monday so if anything has changed by the time you check out this video of course I can't change anything so take all of this with a pinch of salt all right. So your character is created and it's time to move. Now this is a full run through the controls some of these are very obvious and I'm not looking to patronize anybody here but you might just find some handy shortcuts that you didn't know about. First and foremost, WASD to move and the mouse movements turns the camera. Very simple. Left click is your primary attack, your right click is your secondary attack, and on the R key in the bottom left corner, as you can see, is your ultimate ability. So each class is different. So for a brief summary on the mana consumption, the stamina costs, for all of the abilities that your character has, press the F1 button, and in the bottom left corner, you're going to get this big tooltip that shows you everything regarding your character. If you want to sprint around the world, that's on left shift, and then if you want to call your pet or right your pet you simply do that by pressing T. Now this is probably one of the first major control changes so in the previous build of the game when you scrolled the mouse wheel that would zoom the camera in and out from your character now though it actually zooms the mini map in the top right corner in and out if you want to control the actual camera then all you need to do is hold control and then do the mouse wheel now if you go ahead and hit the escape key you can see the shortcut keys for all of the other menus that we have available so it's c for crafting b for bag m for the map and when you're inside of the map it's left click to rotate right click to move and obviously the mouse wheel to zoom in and out or Oh, and just one more handy little note on the maps you can actually go ahead and press the middle mouse button in order to place a marker this will always be a star so you know it's special for you it's o for options and j for social that is where you can invite people into your world or join your friends and just a little note on this any of the white names are people currently playing cube world and all the gray names are people who aren't now i'm being a little bit preemptive with this one but if the skill tree does return in the full release of the game in the alpha build the key for that was x now these final keys are probably the ones that you won't have known about so far so if you happen to press F2 or F3 that is going to scale the entire of your hood upwards or downwards really helpful depending on how large you like to have those continuing along that top row if you hit F4 that hides the entirety of the hood and you press it again to re-reveal it and then finally a nice little quality of life addition is being able to scale the mini map in the top right corner of your screen with F5 and F6 and I very nearly forgot you can press F to turn on your lamp so as I mentioned before, the most common first experience that a lot of players seem to be having, myself included, was that when I first jumped into the game, the first mob that I approached to get into a scrap with completely annihilated me. It one-shot me. And a lot of that is probably down to how the difficulty works now in the game. So previously, you would spawn on point zero, and the further you moved away from that point, the more difficult the game got and the more dangerous the terrain became. This time around, though, you're inside of something known as a zone. And within this zone, you're going to have all rarities of monsters, and they go from rarity one through to five so white is star one you've got green for star two blue for star three purple for star four and gold or legendary is on star five so in the beginning you're going to be completely naked so it's best that you avoid everything other than probably white and maybe green mobs if you're confident with your abilities to give you an idea of when you can probably tackle stronger monsters go ahead and open up your bag that's on the b key and you'll notice on the left hand side of the screen you've got this huge character sheet that opens up now beneath your name and your level you'll see some star ratings for both weapon and armor so once those improve as you collect gear throughout the world that should help you gauge which color mobs are actually defeatable and very quickly on the topic of mobs just before we move away from that remember that the health bars are really important so if they have a blue health bar then they're a friendly npc that you can chat to and you definitely should uh, if they've got a red health bar they're going to be aggressive and will chase you if you come too close and then if they've got a green health bar they will retaliate if you attack them but that also signifies that they are a tameable creature so what is a zone? I mentioned that phrase just a moment ago and it's time to clarify exactly what that means. So a zone is a large area of the map that is basically home to a load of different objectives. So if you open up your map by pressing M, you'll notice that when you hover over different parts of landmass, that a large white line will circle a large area. Everything inside of that line is a single zone. Now some of them are quicker to complete than others depending on how much landmass there is, how well hidden the objectives are, but it took us around about 8 hours to do a fully 
grassland biome on our first day. But for comparison, earlier on today, we completed the zone in a mere two hours, and that was because it was pretty much all water, and there was only a few islands, which meant that all the goodies were right in place. Now, the biggest point that I need to make about zones is that the gear that you find within them is only useful inside of that zone. So let's say you've got a fully decked out character, you've got legendary armor, five stars all around. The moment you step over that white line, poof, you're back to zero stars on all gear. The items do have very minimal stats, but they are next to useless. Now, one of the biggest misconceptions that a lot of players have when they start out is that all of that gear has been deleted. That's not the case, because if you open up your inventory and look towards the bottom part of the equipment window, you'll actually see the name of the zone that you're currently in and the little arrow either side. As you press those arrows, you can toggle through individual inventories for individual zones. There is, however, an exception to this rule, though, and that is items that have a plus symbol at the end of their name. Never sell these. Keep a hold on to them for dear life because they are items that can work in surrounding zones, sometimes even two zones out. Hopefully by the time the game launches we'll have the exact number on just how far these pieces of equipment can go. But to give you an idea of how hard they are to come by, after our first 12 hours of play and doing two zones completely through, I had three white pieces, I had two greens and one purple. And it's important to note as well that the whites and the greens that I listed there, I actually purchased from Venn inside of the towns. And then the purple one that I got was from a boss drop. And actually earlier on today, just before recording this video, I got a legendary drop from another boss. So it is possible. As well as your equipment, there is something else that you lose when you transition into a new zone. And that is all of your key items. Let's go through what each one of these is and explain what they do. So up first, I think we've got the staple tool from the alpha, and that is the hang glider. This is a handy little kite that basically lets you glide through the air if you jump off of something large and it uses stamina to keep you afloat. This one is equally as helpful and it is the boat. It allows you to sail across water at a very swift pace. Next up we have got the reins and this basically allows you to ride any of your tamed pets that have the riding capability. Now the rest of these are brand new additions and we begin with the divine harp. So this is used to open giant golden doorways that can be found throughout the world. Typically they'll be at the beginning of dungeons to actually grant you entry into them or sometimes you'll be partway through a dungeon and it will actually allow you to open the door to go into a treasure room. This next one is probably one of the more adorable ones. It looks like a Wiimote, but it's actually a whistle. It's known as the Sky Whistle. If you play this next to a bird statue, then it will cause little bluebirds to swoop down, grab you, and they'll lift you up to any sky platform that is nearby. So if you ever see a sky platform and think, how am I going to get up there? That's how you do it. Now this next one's a little bit spooky. This is known as the spirit bell. So this will actually transport you to the spirit realm, which will make you transparent and it means you can walk through certain objects. More often than not, you're gonna be walking through doors or gates that will lead you to treasure. I'll be honest, this next one is a little bit easy to miss because it just kind of looks like a teardrop or like a blue flame, but this is known as the treasure spirit. So after collecting this little doohickey, it will stay hidden pretty much all of the time, except for when there is treasure nearby. By. When it detects this treasure, it will pop out and it will float around your character. If you follow the direction it's pointing in, then eventually you should come across probably a bit of dirty land or a little bit of discolouring in the earth that you're stood on. Place a bomb on that spot and when it explodes, voila! treasure and this is very much so worth doing because some of the gear that you can get from it can literally be legendary tier it's worth it now this next key item we didn't really need on day one but now it's been patched out to actually use stamina climbing is that little bit more difficult again so why not get the climbing spikes these go onto your feet and basically grant you infinite stamina whilst climbing which can be very very helpful and then the final ones aren't that exciting but there are three books of crafting that you'll get from special points of interest so these are magic rare and legendary once you've acquired these, if you press C to open up your crafting menu and scroll down a little bit, you'll notice that you've got loads of brand new delicious recipes. But again, just a warning, the gear you create will be unique to that zone, so it might not be worth it. Now it's all well and good telling you about these key items and about different bits of equipment, but where are you going to find them? So there are three basic answers to this question. First and foremost, kill things. Mobs and bosses drop loot every now and then. The higher their difficulty level, the higher the loot tends to be. Answer number two is pretty obvious as well. You go to the towns, you enter the shops, you can buy some goods. And just two small side notes actually whilst we're talking about towns. Firstly, yes, you can still draw blocks onto your weapons to make them stronger. The bench for that can always be found right by the anvil and the furnace. Screw whoever started the rumour that that was taken out of the game. Shame on you. And more importantly, note number two is that every class has two professions that you can swap between at any time. 
time. Go to a town, look for the crown icon on your mini-map and speak to the NPC that's there and you can change between them at will. So for example, I'm a rogue and I can alternate between a ninja and an assassin at any given moment. They have different play styles, different abilities, go and experiment with them. Anyway, back to the topic of loot locations and get ready for the most important tip about Cube World in 2019. Speak to NPCs always. It doesn't matter whether you're out in a field, whether you're in a town, or whether you're getting drunk in a tavern, talk to every NPC that you can, because for that zone, they're going to give you literal pinpoint map markers as to where you can find both key items and instances where you can fight mobs in order to get awesome loot. So let's say that you've spoken to all the NPCs in your zone, now you're going to have a ton of markers all over your map. Let's start explaining what each of those is. First up, we have got the Gnome Rescue. If you can see a gnome head on your map, then make your way over to that location and get ready for a fight. They're colour coded which is handy so you'll know whether you're strong enough to tackle that objective currently. And so far I've encountered two different types of gnome scenarios. So the first one is that a gnome is stuck inside of a cooking pot and all you need to do is slay the party that are stood around them ready to munch on them. Once you've done that the gnome will be like, oh thank you very much, here's some loot, whoa! And the other one, a little bit more sinister, they'll either be stuck inside of a cage, tied to a table, they've got a ball and shackle on their ankle. Either way, defeat the nearby boss mob, it's going to drop a key and you can unlock the little bugger. And in addition to the cool loot that you get from these gnomes, they also now go back into the towns and increase the rarity of items that are sold in the shops. So it's a win-win. Next up, we have got the sword. So the sword isn't an entrance to a dungeon unfortunately. That's what I thought it would be. This is actually an overworld combat encounter that often consists of destroying spawners and mobs that spill out of them. So for example, one of the ones I came across was a pile of bones and skeletons would infinitely come out of it until you destroyed said pile. Normally in these areas as well, you'll have NPCs that are around fighting the good fight and if you help them out, you clear out the mobs, they'll give you some prizes. Now I've only encountered this one the once so far, but dark portals are a thing. So on the map, it's going to look like a red mirror icon. And when you head over there, it's going to be a fairly tough fight. Majors are healing up the portal. Monsters are consistently jumping out of it. There are large bodyguards all around. Clear out the whole lot, destroy the portal, and you're done. Next up, we have got crafting. So if you notice a crafting hammer on any of your points of interest, this basically means that when you complete the objective there, which is usually slay a load of monsters, then you're going to receive yourself a crafting book. And of course, as I mentioned before, there are only three of them. Now, some of these points of interest are a little easier to spot than others simply by zooming into the map and having a look around. This one is probably the easiest because it is a large X shape on the map because this is known as a mana pump and these are a relatively simple encounter. All you need to do is go to each end of the X, destroy the generator that's there as well as the boss mob and then when you make your way back to the center an even larger boss mob will appear, destroy that, destroy the pump and peace will be restored. Once you've completed all of the mana pumps for that zone it will actually give you a little prompt to say congratulations and I'm assuming that it has some kind of effect elsewhere in the zone and I say that because the next one we're going to talk about is the dark crystal so myself and Toby ran into a tower that had a dark crystal in it it was at the top of the tower we destroyed a load of mobs along the way and when we got rid of it we noticed that in a dungeon that we previously visited the sort of mana wall or shield that was blocking a treasure room had now dissipated so even though I haven't seen what the mana pump actually did just yet it had the same ending message as the dark crystal next up we have got the skull icon. For us that took the form of an arena, or a coliseum technically I guess, where basically we could speak to an orc who would spawn in a green rarity enemy, so that's obviously level 2. Once we defeated that we spoke to the orc again and he spawned in a blue, so on and so forth until we had vanquished all rarities of monsters and the legendary final fight was finished. Each step of this gave us some really really spicy loot and if it works similarly to dungeons hopefully this resets every single in-game day which means that you could actually go ahead and grind this out for some really cool gear. So this next objective we've only encountered the once and it seemed to be a mixed bag. We had a legendary tier monster and as well as that we also had a pretty significant piece of lore which was on a tablet on the back of a rock. So I don't know if they always come as a pair or if we just got very lucky. But either way, go there only if you know you can beat it. So those are all of the different encounters that we've had so far. If there are any more then feel free to let me know in the comment section below what they entail and also what the symbol would be on the map. But there is one more that we still have haven't spoken about yet and that is dungeons. These are the big finale, the big crescendo at the end of any given zone. They are legendary tier, usually 5 out of 5 stars, although we did run one that had 5 stars but didn't have a single legendary mob within it. 
cheeky. So their symbol on the map is a large orange dot. It's not that glamorous, it's not that shiny or exciting, but it's quite distinct. And we'll talk about how to make that orange dot appear in just a moment, but very quickly, let's cover what's inside of dungeons. So you go down a staircase, you enter the first room, once you've defeated the mobs, you move down another corridor, so on and so forth. There are a couple of different directions you can travel, but from my experience so far, they never meet back up, and the dead ends don't tend to last any more than about two turns. So they aren't quite the large and confusing labyrinths that we had in the alpha build, which I kind of miss honestly, and I'm hoping that in the 1.0 build, they'll be a bit more fleshed out. Now every so often, you're going to come across a big metal gate that just simply won't budge. You can't squeeze through it even though your pixels look small enough, you can't use the spirit bell to phase through the thing, you actually have to defeat a mob nearby, usually a legendary or it's the biggest one in the room, and that will actually unlock the door automatically. So you've battled your way to the end, you open that last chest and you gain an artifact. That is what this has all been for. This will stay in your bag forever and it grants little perks. So for example, I've got ones that give me faster riding on my pet, quicker gliding speeds, and it lowers the stamina cost when I'm swimming underwater. I say that all in an excited tone, but they're kind of lame. They don't really feel ugh enough, you know what I mean? I'm going to post a whole separate video of my opinions about the new version of Cube World once we get the full 1.0 release on Monday, because I think for now there could be some other rewards in the pipeline that we don't know about. So other than that extra little buff that you've just gained, you will also gain one entire level on your character, and basically that doesn't do anything just yet. I'm hoping that there's going to be skill points that you can spend in the skill tree when the full thing comes around, and if not then yikes. Please feel free to ignore the people on Reddit and Twitter who have been saying, oh, when you finish a dungeon, all of your items that you currently have equipped get a plus next to their name. You can use your gear everywhere. Total lies. Nothing like that happens. Let's rewind really quickly now then and talk about how you can make the dungeons appear on your map in the first place. Now, this comes with a lot of uncertainty on my part. I've played the game for about 14, 15 hours now and I'm still not entirely sure how we made it happen. My most educated guess so far is that we made it appear by collecting pieces of lore, so little bits of story, from around the world of Cube World. And it seems to be that every piece of information you get grants about 10% of the story and when you hit 100%, that's when the orange dot suddenly pop up everywhere. Now the NPCs in the game won't ever give you information on where to find these pieces of lore, you'll just happen to stumble across them yourselves, or if you look around the map, you can make out some really distinct shapes, so here's what to look out for. Risen circular stone platforms, usually a tombstone sat on the middle of them. You can see dark black buildings, normally they're just kind of like a one block size building, and inside of it there'll be a grave and you can search that for a little bit of story. Or sometimes you'll be able to find a stone tablet which is wedged into the bottom of a tall jagged rock, normally in a circle formation once again, and every time I've found one of those so far, there's been a combat scenario really close by, like a large huddle of mobs. Now again, the only problem with doing all of this is that there are lots of different stories to piece together, and sometimes you can end up unlocking the location of a dungeon for a completely different zone. Good luck. Here's hoping that Wally can give us a total write-up on how things work in the 1.0 update. And I think that just about does it. I hope you found this video helpful. It's around about 20 minutes long, but hopefully every single bit of it has been informative and useful. Just before we head on out, I've got a few other leftover bullet points. First and foremost, if you bought the alpha, you can currently play the beta and you will also get the full Steam release. Your key is on pickroma.com. Log into the dashboard, go to my games, and it's right there. Number two, we don't know the price of the game just yet. Pixie has said it will be around about the same price as the Alpha, so expect it to be somewhere between $15 to $20, roughly. Again, we don't know for certain. And last but not least, one of the most useful movement tools in the entire game is the Flight Master. Very expensive to use regularly, but if you've got friends on your server, you can always fly to them for free. Regardless of where you spawn, because at the moment it seems to be people are spawning tens if not hundreds of zones away from one another, but if you go to a town, go to the large griffin and speak to its tamer, you can click on the head of your friend on the map and it will automatically fly you straight to them at zero cost. And I guess on that topic as well, another zero cost teleportation tool are the shrines. So if you ever see an angel statue inside of a monument, go and interact with it, you'll play your flute and you can teleport there anytime and that'll be a blue dot on your map. Combining those two things can mean your party can get around really quickly. Hello, sorry Martin 
Martin and Ellington here. Just one more little teeny tiny tip before we head on out. Uh, and that is the fact that if you find leftovers around the world, they'll appear in your equipment window. Take those to the village. Go to the magnifying glass icon shop. You give it to the person. It costs one or two gold in order to decrypt. And it will give you something shiny and new. And there we go. I'm done. Properly finished this time. Leave a like on the video if you did find this helpful. Subscribe to the channel if you want to see more keyboard videos as well as other variety content like Zelda, among many other things. Thank you very much for watching. Have a wonderful day and I will see you next time. Bye bye.